I used to keep the secrets of the dead. In my mid-twenties, I began working in the obscure field of organ donation. I wore a white lab coat. I carried surgical equipment in a bright orange shoulder bag and an igloo cooler in the same color. <laughs> I was attached 24-7 to a pager which only buzzed when someone died. I performed human tissue recovery. My specialty was eyes. I removed eyes and eye tissue from cadavers at all hours in myriad settings that range from clinical to creepy. I was a living apparition in their quiet realm, haunting morgues, mortuaries, and autopsy rooms. I perform my strange duty in the deep stillness where the dead reside. There was a macabre formula for these witching hour jaunts. A spook security guard granting me access to the morgue, keys jangling in his wake. The mechanical hum of human-sized freezers. A dim, harsh exam lamp that cast a cold ring of light, leaving the rest of the room in the lurking gray. The perfume of dead things. Formaldehyde, iodine, and decomposition. Faint but detectable, like olfactory ghosts. And when the bag was unzipped and the sheet pulled back, the naked dead, laying as they had been placed, mouths and eyes open to the ceiling, waiting for my work to begin. It was a weird job. <laughs> <coughs> it was also creepy as fuck. <laughs> and funny in a way that mortals could not understand. It had to be. One of the guys at the medical examiner's office learned of my love for the film Silence of the Lambs and would pull up his scrubs to rub, ha rub ham cream into his hairy abdomen when he saw me. It rubs the lotion on its skin, he would say, grinning maniacally. He gave me this rookie hazing for months until one day I started to pull down my pants and show him my Buffalo Bill-style undertuck. <laughs> for some reason, he relented. And that's how it went. We outcreeped each other to find the laughter. I invented the term donor face to describe the mouth open, jaw jutting, claw handed way that donors looked after being on ice for too long. <laughs> I messed with my coworkers by laying down in the middle of the office floor in donor pose, hoping to scare an exhausted coworker as they enter the laboratory late at night. We made up sound effects for causes of death and called living people by their likely diagnoses. When a puffy, red-faced man would walk past our window with his lunchtime cigar, one of us would yell, there goes congestive heart failure. <laughs> it bordered on shittiness, but the jokes were a defense against the sadness of grieving family members and the weight of the secrets we kept. Every day, people died. If I could do my job, Lives could be saved or healed. Tragic news headlines became forecasts of my workload. Coffee was my new water. I learned to sleep standing up. The adrenaline was intense. Cases balanced on mere minutes. If I couldn't make it to the hospital in El Centro before 2 a.m., the funeral home would take the body and we'd lose the case. Or if I wasn't able to track down a donor family in time, someone on the transplant list might be forced to wait or miss a chance altogether. I had opportunities for cushier jobs with normal hours and higher pay, no dead bodies or grieving families to deal with, but those jobs were bullshit. <laughs> I was addicted to the gravity of small moments. I needed the intensity of the life and death struggle to feel alive myself. When my pager went off, I received a name, a brief medical history, and a phone number. Then I called the next of kin. It was essentially a cold sales call, but instead of offering them a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to purchase a Florida timeshare, I was asking permission to cut the eyes out of their dead loved one's head. I was good at it. In person, I was a college-age punk who rode my skateboard across the airport parking lot to pick up coolers brimming with body parts. On the phone, I sounded like a minister in his mid-40s <laughs> with excellent credit and an Ivy League pedigree. The kind of person you could trust with your loved one's corpse. For most families, 
The decision to donate came down to faith, faith in the character of the person they had lost. For some, it was a desperate wish to change that character with one final act. I will never forget one woman's trembling voice as she gave me consent to make her estranged father a donor. This will be the only good thing this man ever did, she said. And I heard the words she never spoke. I knew in that moment this job was not just about curing blindness. It was here, when consent had been obtained, that the real secrets, the dirty secrets, would begin to surface. Each family underwent a painfully intimate interview about the donor's medical and social history. Sex, drugs, hard time, it was all there. Mrs. Miller, was your aunt an IV drug user? <laughs> no, she was a school teacher. <laughs> These objections came fast and furious when the real questions began. I would diffuse them like this. I know, Mrs. Miller, I'm sorry. We're required to ask about high-risk behaviors to ensure the safety of the tissue. Or if you were my friend Latanya, you might not diffuse such concerns so skillfully. Sir, did your brother have any history of homosexual behavior? He was a Lutheran minister. <laughs> I didn't ask how he made a living, sir. <laughs> I asked what he did with his free time. One donor family had been notoriously difficult to track down. She had no local family or friends. Her parents in the Midwest had been notified of her death but wished no further contact. When I finally spoke to her mother, I found out why. Mrs. Thornton, I'm sorry to trouble you. I'm calling to ask you a few questions about your daughter, Barbara. She issued a tiny sigh and said tightly, you mean Randy. Oh. I said, I'm, I'm sorry, I must have the wrong number. I was calling to reach the family of Barbara Thornton. We are the Thornton family, her mother said quietly. I paused, confused. Was Barbara your daughter? No, she said, and I heard her sigh again. Randy was my son. Understanding dawned. I struggled to comprehend how a team of technicians had examined Barbara and not known she was transsexual. If teams of medical professionals could miss this, imagine who else could. <laughs> I remembered the idiocy of transphobic men I'd heard over the years, swearing they would never sleep with a tranny <laughs> and could never ever be fooled. If dudes in white coats could be fooled, dudes in affliction t-shirts had no chance. <laughs> Some families would respond calmly through the worst questions with something comparatively minor would set them off. Mr. Ackerman, had your wife been incarcerated for more than 30 days in the last 10 years? No, she is not, he answered tersely, and I find the question distasteful. They had been married for more than 50 years. I understand, sir. I'm very sorry. We're just trying to assure the safety of the tissue for transplantation. She's not tissue! I heard a choking sob before he slammed the phone down. I called him back, frantic with remorse. No answer. I left countless apologetic messages over the next week, but I never talked to him again. I spoke once to the daughter of an elderly donor. She had a soft European accent I couldn't identify. I asked her if her mother had had sex for money or drugs, expecting the standard indignant no. But her mother had lived through World War II France. After losing her husband in the war, she prostituted herself to German troops in order to feed her kids. Her daughter was so embarrassed about revealing this private family shame that she wept to me over the phone. I listened, but I didn't hear a shameful secret. I heard the story of a survivor. She'd been a fierce mother who did what she had to for her family through, most, through tragedies most human beings will ever know. I offered this perspective to her daughter, but it, it felt preachy and awkward. I was a 25-year-old trying to comfort a middle-aged woman who had lived with a private family shame for decades. This was the nature of my job. Working beneath the shadow of death eliminated the differences between us. Age, sex, race. Death reduced us to memories and secrets. One of the last secrets I shared in those days came from a donor's friend. She insisted that I call her Carol and describe herself as Mark's best friend. She'd been the closest thing to family that he'd had in life before he died suddenly of a heart attack in his 50s. 
I took Carol through the first three pages of interview questions and was surprised by her instant recall of his medical history. She'd been with him through every bump in the road. They lived next door to each other. They drove each other to doctor's appointments. They bought groceries together. They drank coffee every morning and watched TV every night. But they never married or got together. I wanted to know why. When I came to the real secrets, her voice grew quieter and I pressed my phone against my ear to hear her. Carol, had Mark had any history of homosexual activity in the last five years? No, she said quickly, but as I continued on to the next question, she stopped me. He never said as much, she said, and I know he had never, ever been with anyone, but I always knew Mark was gay. Oh, I said. He never came out to you or anyone else? She paused. He never came out to anyone ever, she said. Mark was a wonderful man, but he could not come out. He couldn't find the words before he, before he died. The quiet between us deepened in the way it did in the morgues, in the funeral homes, at moments when the secrets of life and death were revealed. You are saying the words for him, I said. I guess so, she said. He was my friend. He was who he was, and I loved him for it. She came out for her friend because he couldn't do it himself. That being gay in 2003 was not a big deal or that he had no family didn't matter. He carried the secret like a mortal wound. And though he had never said the words to Carol, she shared Mark's secret over the many years of their friendship. As the last act of that friendship, she unburdened him of that secret to me. I left that job years ago. I'm a fire chaplain and I run a nonprofit for firefighters in crisis. I keep the secrets of the living now. I listen to these men and women talk about what they've been through and what it's done to them and their families. They're among the toughest, and their pain is among the worst. And when they finally surrender to it and the weeping comes, it is quietly devastating. All the air leaves the room, and as before, time slows, the quiet deepens, and we hold hands and share secrets. When I die, I'll take them with me. That's J.D. Burke.